Now, this machine is going to be kind of an interesting review. I don't really know where would be a good place to start, other than saying I have never come across a machine where I have been simultaneously so impressed and yet so disappointed with it. So, to start off with a little backstory on my side of things for this model, Dyson. When I heard about these coming out, there were a couple things that came to mind. My first was, this is probably going to crash and burn because normal Dyson machines that are multi-cyclonic let through so much dust to the pre-filter that it is a, a pretty large issue, even though they're one of the better companies as far as bagless filtration goes. The second was that maybe, if it works, this might actually be interesting in terms of almost a return to Phantom type deal with having no filters to bother with, and, you know, truly no loss of suction, even if you never did anything other than empty the bin for three years. And then the reports of motor failures started trickling in, and I came to realize that my first assumption on this was the correct one. Now, what some people, especially more on the Dyson side, will probably come in defending is that... Machines with motor failures may have or probably have been used improperly in that there are certain types of fine materials. I think um, drywall dust, ashes, talcum and baby powder type powders are not supposed to be picked up. Now, while I understand that to a degree with things like ash and... Um, and things like that, I have a real hard time believing that no one ever is going to come across a need to vacuum up something like that in their homes. And it's something that most bag machines, especially if they're using a synthetic bag, will tackle with no problem whatsoever. So that's where a big part of my issue comes in. Another one is, I'm sure that people will say, that try and defend these machines, that, well, the bin has its maximum fill line, and a lot of people go over that. And yes, that's true, but that's also true for every single bagless machine that's ever been on the market. You have to design with a certain knowledge of what customers are going to do to abuse your machine, and rule out certain design drawbacks that make it impractical or likely to fail in the event of what would be common misuse. So, to go on to a more positive side, the first time I took one of these apart, I was very impressed with the fact that it actually uses screws throughout, especially in terms of the cyclone for disassembly. Now, that's something that hasn't really been done by Dyson since about the DC-25. Um, most of the newer ball models, things like the DC-33 that are still more based on legacy platforms, still have the screws inside them, but pretty much everything else in the newer ball range has had kind of finicky to disassemble canisters that were held together entirely by plastic friction fit snap-on fittings which are just horrible for long-term durability if you're going to disassemble it, which honestly, what I've seen, you probably should. So that impressed me. When I took this and used it for the first time, it actually appears to agitate pretty well, which is kind of shocking for a Dyson. You can actually kind of feel the, the vibrations around your feet on the floor. But at the same time, it still has a lot of Dyson's long-term design flaws like the very tight airflow space on the nozzle and things like that. You can check out the disassembly video that I did on the canister of this when it came into work and hear about the reasons why this machine was traded in. 
Now, other than that, it's still pretty much typical Dyson fare. It's got the hose that's next to unusable because it just constantly collapses back. It's got pretty much everything else in common with a DC-41 or 65 or any of the other machines. It's just larger and has a different canister setup and a slightly different nozzle, but most things are very similar. Now, one of the big things I have to say is this is the least maneuverable vacuum I have probably ever used that claims to have some sort of swivel steering and high maneuverability. The ball is just too big, too bulky, and there is too much weight from the larger motor that they tried to put in these machines. The other thing is, and you can see, I don't know if I pointed this out in my disassembly video, but it's mounted in a pretty weird way. From what I remember seeing, instead of have it, having it kind of slot in sideways like I remember the DC-40 and 41 and the other machines being, they've actually got it turned this way where the fan is pointing towards the front, the front opening of the motor. It's a pretty weird setup, but it just doesn't work well in terms of maneuverability. Now, what I should do actually before I turn this on one of the big things is I wanted to see how well this truly cleans. And I wanted to do it in a little bit more of a um, controlled way, I guess you could say, than what I would normally do. So I wanted to see if it could out clean one of uh, kind of my worst performing machines. And what I thought most people and most collectors on the internet would agree is one of the lowest performing machines in my collection. I also wanted it to be a place where that lower performing machine was the only thing that had really done any cleaning and that there wasn't anything else that had been used to mess with the results. So the first place I ever took this after doing the complete clean out and kind of refurb on it was my grandparents home. That house has been cleaned by nothing but me with my Auric for probably about the last, I think it was eight months, the last time that I looked from the videos that I made when I first had gotten the Oryx. I figured that would be a good idea. Nothing else has gone through that house. It's only been me. I don't clean very thoroughly um, in that home. The Oryx pretty much gets about one pass over each area and that's it so it's not something where i generally take a lot of time or clean thoroughly and so with all the reports from people online talking about how well these worked and how much dirt came out of their carpet that they didn't realize their old vacuum was leaving behind I thought it would be interesting to see if it actually lived up to that claim. I didn't think it would because it seemed to be normal Dyson hype um, that a lot of kind of clueless consumers indulge in, but I figured I would see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the camera down really quick um, and stop the recording because we're pretty quickly approaching uh, the, the 10 minute recording limit that this camera has because I've been ranting for a while. And this is the dirt in here that I got from the first time of cleaning my grandparents' home with this machine. So I'm going to dump this out on the carpet, show you exactly what we got, and uh, we'll look through it. Now, bag is completely empty. This is all this Dyson was able to get up. And what I should mention is those Oryx like I use come up quite a lot on eBay in uh, new other condition, in scratch and dent boxes with damage from shipping, things like that. So I paid under a quarter of what this originally retails for, I believe, for most of, well, the, the two classic XL Oryx that I have. Now, there's a week time span in between when I clean my grandparents. I go every weekend to clean their home. Now, I would honestly say that's about a week of buildup from their home. I mean, if you disagree with me, feel feel free to, to leave it in the comments if you don't think this is 
a week of, of dirt buildup. Now, I did a couple things that I don't do with the Oryx. So, it had been a while since I had taken, like I said, anything with a hose. So, I did their upholstery, and I did under their cabinets in corners where the Oryx, just by nature, can't reach. So, this has quite a bit that the Oryx never would have had a chance at getting that it's pulled up. But, overall, I figured there would be a lot more... You know, I was, my, my grandfather is insane. I'll have to put in a, an image, if I can find it, of when I use my clear track in my, my grandfather's bathroom because talcum powder, he uses a ton of it. And I pulled about, oh, a good three or four canisters full, I, I believe, from his bathroom. So, well, three or four of these canisters full in the clear track is how I guess I should put that. I figured, you know, the Oric would be leaving a lot behind that this could pull up. So, I was wrong in that aspect. And then, once I got this home, what I've started using this machine for primarily is for cleaning up things that, quite honestly, I just don't want to with my other machines, especially since there's no filter maintenance on this machine. So, it's been cleaning up Capture, it's been cleaning up the carpet fresh that I put on this carpet, which, if you haven't viewed the video on that Shark Navigator, please go watch that. It'll give you a little bit more context on this. So what I did, and I didn't capture any of that on video, because I, I was just curious. It was late at night and I was playing around. I used this to get up as much of the carpet fresh as I possibly could out of this carpet with it. I did it till there was absolutely nothing coming into the bin. And then I went and grabbed my Oric with the shakeout bag and went back over. Pretty quickly, not really trying to be too thorough, the Oric pulled up more, which kind of surprised me. I, I, I didn't really, truly expect that. Now, that doesn't mean the Oric got this carpet entirely clean. Again, unplanned, when I went over this carpeting with that shark, and this has been vacuumed multiple times by both that Oric and the Dyson since then, this is the amount of carpet shake powder, that's just cat hair in the middle there, that's been pulled up. And that's not going nearly as slow with that shark as I did with this. So, performance-wise for a top-of-the-line Dyson, this is truly pathetic. I, I think this is honestly one of the worst cleaning machines for its price point, especially, that I've ever come across. It's annoying to work with, it doesn't clean all that well, obviously, and, well, you're probably going to have motor problems with it, with all of the issues with this cyclone system. So I'm going to kind of torture this thing over the however long I have it until it dies with the finest substances I can get into it, and see how long it takes to die because, quite frankly, I don't like it, and I don't really care what happens to it. I'm also not going to sell it on to anyone else or, or put this burden of a horrible machine on them. So, while these held quite a bit of promise when they first came out, they're not worth much. Even Dyson has them on their current outlet refurbished for, I believe, about a hundred and... 89 to 200 dollars and quite frankly you're going to get a lot better performing machine for that money with that shark because they come in at around 199 new and while you're going to have issues with that shark which is a whole nother thing that i address in the shark video it's a, a lot cheaper than one of these new and it's gonna run circles around this so I'll run this really quick and show you guys what it sounds like and then if you have any questions please feel free to leave me a comment about it in the 
in the comments, but um, I, I've been very, very disappointed with this machine overall. I was looking forward to trying it out, hoping that maybe it would be a Dyson that performs well outside of the issues with the Cyclones and things like that, but I really don't think in any way it is. So, here we go. Also, this bin has next to no capacity at all. As you can see, that's about halfway full. And most of that dust actually got more compressed sitting in that bag in my car than it did when it was originally picked up by this Dyson because it was almost full when I originally dumped it the first time. So, that's that's pretty much all there is to this thing. It's very disappointing, very overpriced, and very poor performing in Dyson tradition. All right, now here's about the only thing I'm going to show as far as reassembly, because the rest is all just what you saw earlier in reverse. So this is that spring that I was talking about and basically this release lever has to have the spring put tension on it to make sure it stays in the correct position. Another bit of brilliant Dyson engineering. So what you're gonna need to do and honestly about the easiest way to do this and I'm going to try and show you the best I can because it's pretty hard to do one-handed there will be a little notch for the spring on the back of this lever right here. So what you're going to want to do is take that little spring, and I'll get it dropped out so you can see a little bit better. Take that spring and if the camera will let you see down in there, there's a little chamber for it to sit. Make sure that little flared out end drops into the gap in the back. Then what you're going to want to do is twist this and put the actual latch mechanism down in it so that it's pressing while well, being pressed on by that spring, I should say. So basically, what you're going to want it to look like is like that. And pretty much, once you get that done, and again, apologies for the poor camera work, I just cannot be bothered to get the tripod out. Yeah, this is going to be way too hard to do one-handed, so I'll pause this real quick. Putting pressure outwards on it and slide it down in. That's pretty much all you need to do. It's not going to pop back out after that, and you just screw the rest of it back together.